Good morning, my friend. I hope you're doing well. It is 4.45 in the morning. I hope you're doing great wherever you are. And if you're already awake, good morning. Um, By the time you hear this, it'll probably be 6 a.m. Central Time. Um, Just wanted to chat with you for a few minutes. I got some things on my mind. I mean, I've been writing. You've been uh, talking about this book for a while, and but I just want to spend a little bit of time with you today to, to, just to cover a little bit of ground that I've been working on in the book to give you a couple of things to think about that I think are important. It's going to be kind of a short conversation, but I've been reading Exodus 20 and that whole passage from Exodus 20 through 34 where God's giving the Ten Commandments and the, and the, the whole law to Moses on Mount Sinai. And there's some stuff in there that I think is relevant to us uh, when we're going through stuff in life that's hard. And sometimes you have to go through some darkness, and God will be there with you, but you have to go through some darkness to find the light again. And if you're not willing to go into the darkness and fight through it and, and kind of go through it, um, then you find yourself on the outside, and, and some bad things will happen to you if you if you stay outside the darkness and turn your pain into its own God. And so we'll talk about what that means. Um, we just want to share some thoughts with you about the Ten Commandments and how to make it through when, seen, when things seem really hard. We're going to learn the power of walking into the darkness to find the light. And as always, we'll do that starting today. Hey, friend, I'm so glad to have you listening. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I live in Nebraska in the United States of America with my incredible wife, Lisa Warren, and the super pups, Harvey and Lewis, who are getting so big. I'm a neurosurgeon and an author, and I'm here to help you harness neuroscience, the power of your brain, faith, the power of your spirit, and good old common sense to help you lead a healthier, better, happier life. Listen, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind, and I'm here to help you learn the art of self-brain surgery. To get that done, you can get the show notes and more on my website at wleewarnmd.com. And if you like the show, please subscribe so you never miss an episode and tell your friends about it. If you tell your friends, tap the three dots on your app and share it with your friends. Imagine how much farther we can go. We're in 75 countries around the world, but we can go farther. We can help more people if you'll share it with your friends. I'm Dr. Lee Warren here to help you change your mind so you can change your life. Let's get after it. Love that Tommy Walker music. Hey, listen, to be honest with you, when you've lost a child, there's so much survivor's guilt. You know, you're not supposed to outlive your kids you're just not supposed to like you've, you've got a paradigm for everything else that can happen in your life right you you know that you or your spouse one are likely to die before the other that that's just normal you know that your parents are probably going to go before you do you know that one or more of your siblings might go before you do you're, you expect those things your grandparents are going to die before you do that's that's the the natural path so you're not supposed to think about having to go through losing a child it's just not normal and there's just a lot of survivor's guilt. You you wonder if you did enough, if you told them you loved them enough, if you spent enough time with them. Could you have done something so that they would have ended up in a different place, in a different situation? Or, you know, if, if your child died of some kind of illness or disease, did you miss something? Did you? There, there's all this these questions, and they never go away. And as the years pass, the, the questions become more uh, impossible to answer, and they become more poignant because the the, the distance between the event and the and the time that you've lived past that grows and gets bigger but their lifespan doesn't so they stay frozen in your mind at this age that they were and it's just hard you know it dawned on me the other day i think somebody said it on twitter actually by the way um you know i'm not a huge fan of twitter but but twitter is a place where there's a lot of darkness but there's also a lot of light and the church is reclaiming some of that ground and you should get on Twitter if you're interested in, in finding a lot of good good discussions on theology. And there's all kinds of bright stuff out there, too. So I'm at Dr. Lee Warren, at D-R-L-E-E-W-A-R-R-E-N, at Dr. Lee Warren on Twitter. I'm back on Facebook. I told you we lost 2,000 downloads last month because somebody hacked my Facebook. So I am back on Facebook. Uh, you can search me, Lee Warren, and you'll find my picture. That's my real profile. Um, so back on Facebook, really only use Facebook to post a podcast and occasional uh, encouraging posts that come from Instagram. I'm at Dr. Lee Warren on Instagram. But so, um, and Lisa, by the way, is Lisa D. Warren on Instagram, and she's on Facebook as well, and, and she's not on Twitter right now. But anyway, um, somebody said on Twitter, hey, there's not a word for someone who's lost a child. And that hit me right between the eyes. I realized it. When, when you lose a spouse... They call you widow or widower, and when your when your parents die, when you're a kid, they call you orphan. So we have words for those things, but there's not a word for 
a parent who's lost a child. There's not a term for that. We just hurt. It's just sad. There's, there's not a term for us. So shout out to everybody who's been through that. You know what I'm talking about. But, but when I read that, I was like, man, that's really hard. You know, it's hard to have this thing that happens in your life that's so bad that nobody's ever named it before. And so I was thinking about that and writing this book. I've, I've been going through some some kind of hard things. And I've got a, a, a file, basically, that's got a bunch of papers in it. And one of those papers is the death certificate of my son that came in the mail one day. Um, those things always come out of the blue. Um, and so I have this death certificate. And in that file also there's a receipt from the funeral home from paying for my son's cremation. Um, so there's all this stuff that, that, that's in there. And you can go and sit and look at that stuff. And it'll take you to a dark place, right? If you if you go back and, and and dwell on or sit with some of those things, you can find yourself going down this path of, of and it gets pretty heavy and it gets pretty hard, and there's no um, there's no way out of it really if you let yourself go down there. So I'm I'm thinking about that stuff as I'm writing this book and 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 some of the the problems that we had as we were going through those times and how we managed to navigate through all of it, and I realized something that. There, there's a path, there's a passage rather in Exodus chapter 20, there's this scene where God is coming down to Mount Sinai and, and the people are down in the valley and they can see him. They, they can see the cloud and the smoke and the fire on top of the mountain. They can hear his voice and, and they know God's there and he's not very far away. He's right at the top of the mountain and the people aren't allowed to go up there because they're not, you know, they're not they're not ready to face God, but Moses is allowed. And Moses has a relationship with the Lord that, that is close enough that God has said, Hey, you can come up here and we can meet face to face and we can work through this, this set of stuff I'm going to give you that'll help the people manage the hard stuff they're getting ready to face as they go to the promised land. So, so God had a plan and God had a law and he had a purpose and he had ideas and he had, and he had guidelines that would help the people manage to navigate their life. But to get it, Somebody had to go up on the mountain into the darkness, into the fire, into the storm and the lightning and the terror. And it was scary. But Moses had to go up in there. So there's this passage in Exodus 20, chapter uh, verse 21, where it says, The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Now, don't miss this. God is the path to light. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no one comes to the Father except through me. The the good stuff is in finding where God is and going with him and letting him help you and help and manage help you manage your life and being with him. That's that's where the good stuff is. But to get to the good stuff, Moses had to go into the scary stuff. All right? Moses had to go up into that cloud and walk into that darkness, the booming thunder and the lightning and the fire and the terror and the earthquake. He had to he had to be willing to go in there so that God could meet him there and help him equip him and the people for what was coming. He had to go into the storm. Now, there's two commandments. Moses came away with the Ten Commandments on the on the tablets, right? The first commandment, if you don't remember your Ten Commandments from Sunday school, or if you've never read them, Exodus 20 gives you the Ten Commandments. They're not just good ideas. They're actually, they're actually commandments for living. The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. Like God says, hey, I am your God. Don't, don't try to make yourself another God. because You won't find one that will satisfy you or who can help you. I'm your God. The second one is, do not make a carved image. Don't make an idol. Don't, don't make something that you bow to and worship to and believe in other than me. So there's these two commandments that God gives Moses, and for, in order for Moses to get them, he had to go into the cloud, right? But there's those two commandments, no other guys before me, and don't make an idol, are what I want to talk about just for a second here. It's not very long, and I don't want to overplay the metaphor, but I, don't, but, but I realized this as we were going through losing Mitch, that a couple of things could happen. One, if you remember the the movie The Princess Bride. If you never saw it or if you've seen it, there's a scene where they have to go into this place called the Fire Swamp. And there's all this legend about the Fire Swamp that there's perils in there and that nobody ever comes out alive. And that there are three perils in the Fire Swamp and there, you know, this the the eruption of fire that comes up out of the ground. And then there's this quicksand they called lightning sand. And then there's these rodents, these big 
like badger looking things, rodents of unusual size, they call them. And so there are all these perils in the fire swamp. But, but once you go in there, the, the door closes behind you. You can't, you can't go back out the way you came in. You've got to go through it. So you've got to face the perils of the fire swamp if you want to survive and get to the other side where there's safety and there's peace. Right. And that's kind of what is happening here in Exodus 20. Like, like Moses can't get the law. He can't get the tools he needs. He can't get the, the armament that the people are going to need to make it through of how to walk with God into the coming years of their lives if he doesn't go into the hard stuff. And when we lost Mitch, like it became pretty clear that one of two things was going to happen. We were either going to become these people that, that, learn how to, to walk with God and, and manage to find faith and hope and light and peace and joy again and put our family back together and protect our marriage and, you know, and, and make it through. Or we had this opportunity to just sit and become people who basically lived a life around this hard thing that had happened to them. And I'm just so grateful to, to have had Lisa's friendship and wisdom and, and, and patience and all of that. She was so strong and, and so helpful. But also, we had been studying all these patients with glioblastoma and hard things. I was preparing to write this book that turned into I've Seen the End of You, and I had already identified this this pattern of behavior that happens in people when they encounter hard things. When you get that phone call that something bad has happened or when you find that get that biopsy result and that's bad news or, or when something difficult happens in your life, there, there's some patterns of behavior that I noticed. That one of them is some people hit that hard thing and it just destroys them and they lose their hope and they lose their faith and the thing that happened to them becomes the thing that they spend the rest of their life dealing with. And it becomes their identity. And we see it with, a, there's a condition called trigeminal neuralgia, where they, there's basically a pinched nerve at the brainstem and people get facial pain. And it's this debilitating, lightning like de- horrible facial pain. Some people can't even brush their teeth or feel the air conditioner hit their face without just breaking down. It's just excruciating. And the, and the thing that happens is this is invisible pain syndrome and you, nobody can see it. You look normal and it begins to, change your behavior because you're avoiding the pain and these families become sort of um, their lives become about almost revolving around the person who's in pain how can we help mom not have pain you see with migraine chronic migraines and you see with chronic pain syndromes or people with chronic illness in childhood it becomes the social dynamic of their family and with trigeminal neuralgia we can do an operation often that will cure that pain we can move the nerve move the artery away from the nerve and take the pressure off the nerve and the pain will go away. But the problem is these people have often had years where that pain syndrome made them the center of their family dynamic. And when we take the pain away, that social stuff doesn't just disappear overnight. And so these people have had a lifetime of being the center of their family's attention. And when the pain goes away, the dynamic is difficult all of a sudden. They're not just nor- they don't have a normal relationship. Right, and so we see that with people who encounter hard things, we lose a child, for example. We 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 had all these people who were very kind and were offering to invite us to support groups. And I remember one lady called multiple times, pestering us almost to try to get us to join the support group with her. Sorry, a little sip of coffee there, um, and I said. Oh, who did you lose? You know, did you did one of your children die, or you know, how did you get involved in this? And she said, "No, I didn't. I didn't lose a child. Her her sister's son had overdosed and almost died, but but survived fifteen years ago. And when she had that hard thing happen to her sister's son, it it rocked her world a little bit. She started going to the support group for people who had lost children, even though she hadn't lost a child." And she ended up in this support group every week for the next 15 years, and she was still using it as the way she processed that traumatic event that had happened to her nephew 15 years before. So this woman basically began to define her life around this event. Instead of learning to heal from it and move on, she stayed in it. And every week she sat with it and cried over it and, and dealt with other people in their situation. And I'm not bashing on support groups at all you need them there's especially for addiction recovery they're vital and they're important but but the purpose of them is to help you get through something not to stay in something understand that if you're if you're dealing with something hard the purpose of it is to learn how to live with that reality that it happened but have it no longer or not always define your life and so we were sitting in this situation where 
we had a branch point, right? At some point after, and then you have to go through a grief process, but at some point you've got to sit up again, get dressed, wash your face, shave your face, put your clothes on, go back to work. You've got to start building your life back, right? You got to start moving forward again. And for me, it was very tangible. I had this horrible situation that happened with our son and questions we would never be able to answer and, and never would be able to know the, the, the reality of what really happened. And, and we could be these people who like, you know, picketed the police and demanded answers and filed lawsuits and did all that stuff. We could have been those people who made our life about trying to get to the bottom of what happened or who sat and worshiped at the altar of grief and pain and, and, you know, poured drink offerings and into our bodies and, and drank alcohol to manage the pain and numb ourselves from, we could have done that, but we didn't. We, we looked at it a different way. We said, we want to go into this and, and let God meet us there and help us walk through it. And I thank so much, thank my father-in-law, Dennis, and my mother-in-law, Patty, who had lost two of their own children, who give us that counsel and guidance to help us move down the right path, and, and Lisa being so strong and all of that. We, God was very tender to us and led us and put us around people who had been through what we had been through or were going through. And so here, go back to this Exodus 20 chapter, this Exodus chapter 20 passage, and look at what's happening. So the people are down in the valley, right? And God is on the mountain in the cloud. The people can't go up there. But Moses has a choice. He can stay in the valley or he can go up the mountain and meet with God, even though it's really scary. But notice what happens to the people. The people in the valley who don't go into the cloud, they stay in the valley and they stay down in the valley and they don't, they don't have the opportunity to sit with God and they decide after a few days that they need something they can put their hands on. They decide they're going to make their own God. That's so, it's appallingly ridiculous. The real God is on the mountain. They can hear his voice. They can see the storm where he is and they get restless and they make themselves an idol. They, they melt all their gold and make a golden calf. And in Exodus 32, they're worshiping this false, fake, idol, man-made God, even though the real God is right next to them on the mountain. And so what they've done is they've taken their, their lives and they've, they've decided that they need something tangible that they can put their hands on, that they can worship even though they have an opportunity to, to wait for the real God to reveal himself to them. And here's what, here's what happens when you're grieving or when you're going through something hard. You have an opportunity to either worship the thing that you're dealing with and let it define you or to let the real God help you learn how to process and manage and handle it in a way that will lead you through the darkness and through the storm and to find the light again. The problem is if you stay in the valley and you make yourself an idol out of the thing that you're dealing with, you will never actually get through it. You'll never get through the fire swamp if you don't learn to navigate those hard things and avoid those rodents and avoid the quicksand and avoid the, the fire spouts and all that stuff. If you just stay in the swamp, you'll eventually be consumed by it. And if you stay and sit with your grief and make an idol out of it, or you, you know, I had that death certificate and that receipt, and I could have made an origami golden calf out of that, and I could have just sat there and drank myself into oblivion, or I could have become this bitter person who was mad that my son died, and I, and I was just never going to get over it, and you know, turn to some other way to numb myself from that. I could have done that. But I had this, these guides, these mentors around me. I had a Moses who went up into the cloud for me. My father-in-law helped me navigate that. Lisa helped me navigate that. My mother-in-law, Patty, helped me navigate it. My parents came alongside us. And we had, we had people who helped us. And you can too. But when you're going through the hardest thing, I would just encourage you, be willing to go into that dark place and learn, let God help you manage it. Let God help you understand it, get to know it. Don't be afraid of going into the cloud and facing the storm because even though it's, it's hard, it hurts, I mean, it'll feel like he's carving the pain into your stone tablet heart. He'll, he'll carve it into you, but you'll come through it on the other side with a set of capabilities that you didn't know you had. Some of them are surprising. I, I, I learned that I could see people around me and, and notice their pain. And after a while, I learned that I actually had some tools to help them. And when I did choose to help them, it helped me too. 
That's why you're listening to this podcast, by the way, like me noticing other people who were hurting and trying to find some words to help them process what they were going through based on the experience that I had of what we were going through. That's why this podcast came about. That's why my newsletter came about. That's why my books came about. So you can find some good and some light and some some healing, but you can't find it unless you go through the fire, unless you're willing to go into the darkness. If you don't want to go in there and heal from it, you'll end up being that person that sits in the support group and just worships it forever. And it'll never get better. It'll never become lighter burden. Like God won't unburden you of it if you sit with it and let it become a golden calf, an idol of its own. So even though the thing has happened and you survived it, even though they fixed the nerve and your face doesn't hurt anymore, you can choose to sit with it and stay in it and let it define you and keep defining your family and all that forever if you want to. Or you can walk into the darkness and face the fire and face the lightning and face the earthquake and find God in it and he will carry you through it. He will. He's pro- his promise of being close to the brokenhearted in Psalm thirty four eighteen is true. And if you're having a hard time on Father's Day this weekend, friend, or you had a hard time on Mother's Day because you're missing somebody at your table, you need to go through that darkness and let God begin to heal you. And one of the ways he'll do that is he'll equip you to help other people. And your voice and your experience and your unique situation and how you managed it will become something that will be a lifeline to somebody else. And we're connected by these things, all of us connected by these chains of difficult things. And we help each other manage to get through the fire swamp together. But you just have to be willing to set your foot on the mountain and press through that dark cloud and you'll find God there and you'll find other people there who will help you. But you have to start today. Hey, thanks for listening, friend. The Dr. Lee Warren Podcast is listener supported. Check out patron.podbean.com slash Dr. Lee Warren. Patron.podbean.com slash Dr. Lee Warren. Patrons and partners get free books, transcripts, special patron only episodes, and more. And partners like you allow us to stay ad free and keep growing. Please subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode and go to WLeeWarrenMD.com slash newsletter to connect to the newsletter and get to know us. This community is great. It's powerful. It's a great uh, group of people all over the world who are connected at WLeeWarrenMD.com slash newsletter. That's where you get all the info every Sunday since 2014. Without missing a week, we're giving you the best prescriptions for how to change your mind and change your life. Hey, the theme music for the show is Water Into Wine by Tommy Walker, graciously provided for free by Tommy and the good people who are changing the world at Tommy Walker Ministries. Get the music for free and consider supporting Tommy's great work at TommyWalkerMinistries.org, TommyWalkerMinistries.org. And if you need prayer, or if you're willing to partner with us to pray for other people, go to WLeeWarnMD.com slash prayer. WLeeWarnMD.com slash prayer is the place to go. Remember, you can't change your life until you change your mind, and you have to start today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I'll talk to you soon, friend. God bless you, and have a great day.